Another piece of the little shop of physics puzzle is this, that the, we, it, doing this has really taught me that people learn best when they're, when they're active. And I try to incorporate that in my class as much as possible. These days I'm teaching big lecture classes, but there's still creative ways that you can keep people active and engaged, even in the big lecture class. And at this meeting, there's all kinds of wonderful ideas for that. We're going to see some later. We're going to see some later for sure. You can understand something better if you can touch it. And, and kids, are just, they're such grabby little creatures. I mean, look at this. You know, they're just reaching out that they must touch things. And I think there's this kinesthetic sense where if you touch things, you can manipulate things and try things. That's the best way to learn about things. One of my favorite stories about the little shop of physics is we um, went on the road to a school up on the Pine Ridge Reservation and we stressed to the kids, you need to touch things, just go explore and try different stuff. Wonderful little experimenters. And they tried all kinds of stuff we'd never seen before. So we had a group of first graders in there and they were taking one project and taking it across the room and sticking it to, to something else. And why not? And we told them, feel free to do that. And one kid came up and he was looking at my arm. And, and I'm fuzzier than most people he's seen before. And he reached out and he, he licked my arm. <laughs> Just kind of like ex ex an exploratory sense. <laughs> okay, now I think I'll try something else. And I think that's a real plus. I mean, we've created an environment where people can try things out and, and see what happens and, and learn by touching and experiencing things, which is a, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I did a, a web search this morning on like inclined plane problems. And these are like a couple of problems that I have. And I look at these and I think, this one looks pretty, pretty specific, okay? Slides tipped at 31.0 degrees, 1.16 meters per second. What's the coefficient of kinetic friction? I look at problems like that. It's kind of, kind of specific and also kind of like, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and, and then this one here, a sliding board makes an angle of 60 degrees. 60 degrees sliding board, that's a playground you do not want to let show go to. Um, <laughs> that exceeds like safety standards. The average can be 30, the maximum can be 50. And I think we, we need to make things real. And I really, and, and the kids know this. If you want, to, to, to make things so that people can learn about them, they've got to be real. And I was talking to someone yesterday, and they said they, they, they'd shown a problem to their students and then went out and did an experiment, and the student said, oh, I thought that, I thought that was just true in physics, not in life. <laughs> you know? And I said, I think we've got to try to, to make things real. And kids are like that. You've got to make it real to make it, to make it stick. And this is another piece. When I first started teaching, I think I was so worried about my students thinking that I was qualified to do what I'm doing, that I, I actually wouldn't mind confusing them a little bit because, oh, I'm smarter than you. And, but now I'm, you know, I'm so ancient that they kind of accept it. The white hair, the white beard, oh yeah. They kind of accept <laughs> the, the kind of the wisdom factor. And this is one of my new mantras, that it's easy to convince my students that I'm smart, it's harder to convince them that they're smart. And I want to convince them that they can do this stuff, to give them the confidence to try the things and to succeed. And I keep this in my mind. And we do this with the kids, and the way you do it is by just letting them loose and letting them try stuff. And, let, and tell them, there's no right answers or wrong answers. Just try things and see what happens. You're going to have experiences, data, you know, and, and you're going to come up with some uh, insights. And we might help direct it, but just letting them free. Um, um, that's something which I try to integrate in my teaching as much as possible. And ultimately, this is how I'm thinking about my job these days, is to design an, envir design an environment in which students can learn. And the Little Shop of Physics is all about that. We don't, when we take, go out to school, we sell our stuff up, we just let the kids loose and we let them explore and let them experiment. We don't teach them anything. The kids are, are learning stuff. They'll ask us questions. We might guide them a little bit. But they're just doing it by themselves. And ultimately, the students are going to learn stuff. We just have to like set up an environment but we let that happen. And to have the students be enthusiastic and enjoy it, we have to share, we have to share that enthusiasm. And, and this was, is something that little kids will let you know. I mean, if you show up to school and you don't look like you're having a good time, it is gonna be a sad and awful experience. And, and so um, working with kids, wonderful, wonderful thing to help me kind of ramp up the enthusiasm level. Finally, I wanna say this, that there's lots of different ways to do something well. There's a many, many different models of teaching that you see at a meeting like this, and that's one of the things I love about it, is that I get to see all kinds of different people do things all kinds of different ways, and I can pick a little piece from here and pick a little piece from there. You've got to come up with something that works for you. And the way we do things is working great for us, and it's taught me a lot of things. Um, I encourage people to kind of like learn what you can from it, but ultimately, 
this is your classroom, this is your program, so you've got to come up with a style that works, works for you. Here's the final lesson. Some things are worth doing just, just cause. I mean, and, and we're going to see some things like that later, but I wanted to, to, to do a couple of other things. And first I'll say, as you're doing this, and particularly when you're starting out, it can be really, really intimidating, but as you start this, you are not alone. And I want to recognize, you know, the AAPT, I mean, the first time I came to the AAPT meeting, it was, it, I just couldn't believe it. It was like in a candy shop. There's all this, like, amazing stuff to get. And the first people who met me, they kind of, like, took me under the wing and, and, and showed me things was the Pyra folks. A very, very accepting, cool group of folks. And um, I've helped a lot. The Colorado, Wyoming section of the AAPT, kind of locally, we have some amazing educators, and very much responsible for putting together a packet of stuff for the application for this award, for which I'm... I'm tremendously grateful, and I suspect perhaps responsible for the t-shirts as well. No. Uh, Chris Nichols. Chris Nichols? Oh, Chris, you scamp. So, um, <laughs> the Denver area physics t-shirts as well. Steve Iona runs this amazing uh, series of meetings down in Denver. Um, fantastic stuff. And the Colorado Association of Science Teachers. And drawing on the resources, and I've had a chance to do that. When we go down the road, it's ultimately this experience of working with kids. We get a chance to practice and refine the craft of teaching. And really, what the Little Shop of Physics has bought me is this, that I get every week um, a chance to be in, in classrooms with all different kinds of kids, all different kinds of ages and backgrounds and abilities and interests, and try things out with them. And it's a wonderful laboratory to see how things work. And so going on the road, taking physics outside the classroom, I mean, it's great for the kids that we visit, but the main beneficiary has been the people who present the program. These are some folks who are physics teachers or physics teachers to be, um, who have learned uh, a lot about teaching physics by, by practicing in the classroom. And sometimes, um, sometimes I think people doubt if you know the experience of explaining things to kids transfers nicely to the college classroom. Oh, but it does. Because I think it's a lot harder to talk to a 10-year-old about stuff than it is to talk to a 20-year-old, ultimately. And so it's, it's a hard challenge. Then when I back up and I can talk to the college kids who like sit still for more than 15 seconds, it's like, whoo, I can use big words and I can talk in full sentences. This is fantastic. And it's much easier. But we, we use this as a way of kind of like, it's, it's, like pra it's like practicing for a marathon by running at altitude. That's kind of like what Little Shop of is like. But... This wouldn't mean anything if we weren't able to teach the kids, if we weren't able to teach kids things. And we've been doing some investigations, and one of the things we've benefited from in being part of CMAP is that we have worked with people in a sociology department to help us really, really formally assess everything that we're doing and see, you know, is it having an impact? And I'm going to show you some data from this. Okay, we do pre-test and post-test with kids. And here's one that has an atmospheric thing. In Colorado, sometimes wind blows from high elevations and low pressures and amounts to low elevations and high pressures on the plains. As the air does this, it A, cools up, B, sorry, cools down, B, warms up. We ask kids this. Now, we've got a couple of stations. This one in particular is called Pressure Cooker. And the name kind of like hints what it's about. Pump air into a bottle, it warms up, let air out of the bottle, it cools down. We show this. But we don't make the connection to the atmosphere. And nobody sits next to a kid and makes sure that they've seen this. They just happen to see it or not. And we don't know what they're doing. And they're certainly not reading the written information. I mean, that's one of the things we've learned from our qualitative studies. Like, we can write signs, sure, whatever. It doesn't matter because the kids are just going to start touching things and doing things. But here's, here's data that we have. And we do it in a slightly different way. And this is the, the sociologists they work with. They need to track individual kids. So we track individual kids on tests. And we track. So they start, here's their, their uh, answer on the pre-test, here's their answer on the post-test. So incorrect, 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 incorrect. This is what we want. This is like initially got it wrong and then ultimately get it right. Correct, incorrect. This is like kids went in the wrong direction. And it's interesting, we always get a bunch of kids who do this. And then when we talk with them, they've been affected by their experience. And they've made a conclusion, they've made some sort of a conclusion, not necessarily the conclusion that we'd want them to draw, but they were affected by their experience. And we look at kids who do this and try to refine what we're doing so we can bring this bar down and bring this one up. And we've been able to do this. I think when we started, a lot of our bars were kind of like, we were pushing kids kind of like evenly in both directions. And now we're kind of like getting a lot more of this and a lot less, a lot less, a lot less of that. 
I know typically um, in this population, we look at just um, scores on pretest, scores on post-test, and don't track individuals. And there's particularly this, um, I think, the normalized gain. And so if you compute that, for this experience, 0.52, and I think that's pretty good, isn't it? For an experience where it's like completely informal and nobody has ever says the kids have to do anything, and there's one or two stations which address this topic that the kids could see or not. This is better than I do like lecturing for 50 minutes on a topic, which is humbling and upsetting. It's, it's, it's about, you know, but, but again, you know, this is, I'm a slow learner, you know, and I, I, I gotta like learn this lesson. It's really quite something. We make the environment where the kids can learn, we stand back, watch it happen. Which type of light has the highest energy photons? This is a question that we ask. Now, we don't talk about photons when we talk to kids. We don't use that word necessarily. But they play with red lights, and they play with blue lights, and they play with ultraviolet lights, and they play with infrared. And they get this idea that blue is somehow zestier than red. And they're the ones who make this connection, so ultimately they end up being able to transfer it to answering this question correctly, which is really, it's really gratifying and cool. And we see this on lots of different kinds of questions that we're actually able to teach people content and able to come up with pretty decent learning gains in this very informal, as Nissa stated, high entropy environment. Uh, very, very gratifying, really, really fun.